Hey, g'day. Um, my name's Simon. Ronnie from EGO has asked me to come and have a bit of a chat about psychedelic uh, mushroom harm reduction pointers. Um, I have a background in medicine and mental health and also have been a mushroom identifier and forager for quite a few years now. Um, so I just thought I'd give a really brief rundown of some of the um, things that I think about when I think about harm reduction around um, psychedelic mushrooms. Um, and the first thing to start with is to make sure that you are taking the correct species, that the mushroom you are taking is the one that you thought you were taking. Um, there's quite a few different psychoactive species that grow in different parts of Australia, and there's a lot of overlap between those areas. Um, right up in southeast Queensland, you can get the cold weather woodlover, subreginosa, and the warm weather um, dungleb incubensis growing at the same time. So. It is really important um, to know that you have the correct species, both in terms of the psychoactive mushroom that you think you're taking, but also making sure that it is actually uh, one of those mushrooms. Uh, there are poisonous lookalikes that grow in really similar habitats. Um, gallerinas are often found in, in the same clusters as the wood-loving um, psilocybe subreginosis. So um, do be mindful of that, learn your ID features uh, and learn how to specifically identify the toxic lookalikes that grow in your area uh, alongside the species you're picking. It is probably a bigger concern with the uh, wood-loving subreginosa than it is with the dung-loving species. There are fewer um, possible toxic lookalikes that grow in the dung in the warm weather. Um, Confirm your IDs. There are loads of really useful online resources. Um, EGA has put a bunch of great ones out. Kane um, Barlow has a bunch of really good ones for most of the common Australian species. Um, so learn your ID and confirm it against those, but also reach out to some of the online communities. Um, there's a bunch of really good Facebook groups now and some Discord chats, uh, including P-mans that, um, you know, you can go to to uh, post photos and get some confirmation on your ID from people who um, have some experience identifying these things. And if you are buying um, psilocybin mushrooms, just be mindful of what you're buying, both in terms of knowing which species you're buying. Cultivated cubensis are commonly sold, but then so are the subreginosa, especially in the areas uh, where they, they do grow in large numbers. So double check what species you're buying and make sure that if you are buying them, you're getting it from someone that you trust to know what they're talking about, um, trust to know um, what the mushroom they're giving you actually is um, before you go about consuming it. It's a lot harder to identify dried mushrooms than it is fresh ones. Um, so just be mindful of that as well. It may sometimes be quite difficult to uh, get confirmation on what you've been told if you've been sold dry mushrooms in terms of what they actually are. Um, the second thing, along with making sure you've got the right mushroom, is to make sure that you're taking the correct dose. Um, that is the correct dose for the species because there's a huge variation in potency and dose between um, the common species that grow in Australia. Uh, Cubensis, the dose can be um, one and a half times or up to double the dose of subreginosa. So it's important to know the dose for the specific species that you're actually planning to ingest. Um, know as well that dry weights versus fresh weights vary a lot for uh, mushrooms. For subreginosa and cubensis, they probably lose about 90% of their weight when they are dried. So usually the wet weight will be tenfold the dry weight roughly, but that can vary, um, can vary uh, just individual mushroom to mushroom and species to species as well. Um, so just bear that in mind and do your research around the dose of the mushroom you're looking at. Um, make sure it's the right dose for the situation. Uh, and that includes making sure that it's the right dose for the intention that you've set. Um, you know, five grams of cubensis is probably, for most people, going to be a bit beyond uh, a light, you know, pro-social dose. So just, you know, tailor the dose to your intended experience there's a bunch of online resources um, that can help you you know get a rough idea of the dose of that species that will deliver a certain level of experience but also obviously everyone is a little different and it can even change you know to some extent over time so if in doubt start slow um, it's probably usually better to undershoot than overshoot for most people um, and don't feel pressured to take heroic doses um, it's, it's unnecessary and it's not for everyone. So, um, you know, over time, just figure out what, what's right for you in different situations.
Um, when you get a new batch, even if it's the same species of mushroom, it's worth um, starting a bit slow with that again as well, just because you you never know um, how potent that particular batch is going to be. Mushroom can vary massively, um, potency specimen to specimen, even from the same patch, even from the same flushing, um, which makes it really important if you're getting a new batch of mushrooms to start lower again, um, just to feel them out. And it's usually a good idea if you can to homogenize your batches of mushroom as well. So um, if you have more than one dose collected to uh, dry them all and powder them or find some other way of combining them into a tea or something that can then be metered out, uh, that way you can get familiar with that batch. And it also evens out the difference that exists between specimen to specimen in terms of one can be really, really potent and the next one can be significantly weaker. So it, it, it evens that out a little bit and makes dosing it a lot more reliable when you're doing it by weight than by uh, the number of mushrooms or if you're just weighing whole individual specimens of mushrooms because for something like subregionosa, a handful of mushrooms might by weight be uh, an adequate dose. But if all of those mushrooms in your hand are particularly strong specimens, then you, you, know, you can be way beyond the mark that you may have been aiming for based on the weight. Um, be mindful of your set and setting. Um, make sure that you have a safe place for the entire duration of the experience and you know however long you, you may need afterwards to uh, relax, chill out, process, integrate. Uh, and make sure that you can get comfortable. Um, Again, be mindful of how you actually feel. Is this the right time to be engaging in this experience? Is this the right place to be engaging in this experience? Um, what's your intention for that experience on this occasion? And is this the right situation for that, both internally and externally? Um, consider who else is around. What are they doing? What are their plans? Um, are they also uh, engaging in a psychedelic experience or... Um, you know, do they have some other plans? How comfortable are, are you with the other people that are there? Because it's important that you don't feel or aren't um, vulnerable at any point. Um, and is there a trip sitter, uh, somebody who's going to stay with you and, um, you know, look after you, mind you, um, hold that space for you to make sure that you are safe? And if there's not actually going to be physically someone there to fill that role, is there somebody that you've pre-arranged with that you can contact um, that will be available for you to contact at any point during the experience should you need um, some assistance or some support. Uh, that can be another way that you can have somebody around without necessarily having them in the room with you. Um, and it's just something that you pre-arrange in advance and sort of say, you know, look, uh, up until this hour tonight, can you please make sure that you're available with your phone in case I need to call you for something? You might even arrange that the they check in at some point during the experience, up, up to you to feel that out. Um, consider a plan for any sort of potential foreseeable interruptions uh, and emergencies. And I say that not to encourage you to catastrophize and think through the worst possible situation uh, immediately before engaging in one of these experiences, because that can shift the mood a little bit negatively as well. But um, preparation for a lot of people can actually, you know, reduce the experience of anxiety that might come up with uncertainty during the experience. Um, and on a, a practical level, having some, you know, basic idea of an emergency plan is just important. Um, it, it's good common sense. So, uh, especially if you're outdoors or in an isolated environment, um, just having some, some really basic practical idea of what would I do if I needed to get in touch with emergency services? You know, do you have mobile phone reception? Is there somebody there that can drive a car safely to get you where you would need to be in that sort of situation? Um, so having some plan for those things is both just, you know, basic safety, but also can reduce the anxiety that might pop up if you start to worry about some of those things during the experience. And engaging in sort of childlike playful play can be a really uh, important and rewarding aspect of these experiences for some people. But um, there is a difference between being playful and being reckless. Um, and I think it's important to bear that in mind, you know, for all the uh, anecdotes about climbing up a, an oak tree or whatever in the middle of a thunderstorm um, and, in, you know, enjoying your psychedelic experience up there, it, it 
it's obviously a pretty dangerous thing to go and start doing that sort of stuff while you are, um, you know, taking psychedelics. So it's it's probably better to be playful but not reckless and to try and bear that in mind during the experience and definitely no driving um, during a, a psychedelic experience. Um, and look out for each other. Um, learn some mental health first aid and some trip sitting skills there's a bunch of really good resources around for those specific skills um as they relate to psychedelic harm reduction and care and i think everyone should just do their basic first aid training so that you'll have you know some idea of how to provide some basic care to people if they need it um consider in advance your aftercare and your integration plan um you know how are you going to uh engage with the effects of the experience wearing off what are you planning to do immediately after the experience who's going to be around for that and then a more medium and longer term plan for how you might go about integrating the meaning of the experience um, if if that's part of the intention that you set for that experience um, as well and also how to integrate and who you could turn to for integration if a difficult experience presents itself and you find that that's something you need to uh, actively focus on integrating a little bit more um, afterwards. I also just want to talk really quickly about Woodlover's Paralysis. This is something that I'm particularly interested in and Kane Barlow and myself have done a survey of this and we've talked about the results for AGA before if you wanted to go and have a look at that video. Um, it's Harm reduction for this in, involves a lot of what I've already said about, you know, having a, a trip set up, being um, mindful of the dose, being mindful of going slow with an, a new batch of mushrooms, especially if it is from a new patch, um, and uh, making sure that you're in a safe environment when you um, do take psychedelic mushrooms, particularly the wood lovers that can cause wood lovers paralysis. Um, but there are some extra safety points around this as well and that is that um, this syndrome seems reasonably uncommon but common enough to be mindful of with the psilocybe subregionosa that grow um, you know really widely in the southern half of the country during the colder months um, growing on wood uh, with lover's paralysis syndrome of uh, muscle paralysis that can occur sporadically after taking these species of mushroom um, can affect different parts of the body, can shift around the body and can come on and off in waves. It's often worse when you are trying to use a muscle, which can obviously be problematic when you're trying to do something like chew or walk um, or use your hands for anything uh, meaningful. So be mindful that it does present those extra risks. If you are somewhere where it is going to be dangerous for you to lose the loose use of your legs for any period of time, um, like outside in the cold, camping, um, you know, walking along a, a road or trying to cross a road, um, be mindful that you, you know, you may end up on the ground there and not be able to get up. So I think the first time that you're trying a new batch of these wood-loving mushrooms, um, from the perspective of wood-loving paralysis, it's probably really important to do that in a really safe environment, be extra mindful of the potential risks associated with the sudden loss of the use of some of your important muscle functions. Um, and in terms of, you know, how specifically people are affected by this, I do recommend you go and have a look at that video so that you can be familiar with it. It's not something to be, you know, terrified of, I'm not trying to sort of provoke unnecessary anxiety around it, but it is something that does happen. And it is something that you might be faced with one day. So I think it's important to have some understanding of how it usually presents, how it usually comes on, when it usually wears off, and particularly being mindful that it can actually first come on way after the psychedelic experience has actually ended. Uh, so it wasn't all that uncommon in our survey for people to first notice the weakness the day after the experience. And some people had some pretty profound impairments as a result of the weakness, even the day after the, um, the dose. So, uh, you know, again, also make sure that you have prepared time-wise to have, you know, at least a day after the experience off, particularly if you're trying a new batch of wood-loving mushrooms. Um, and I do think it is you know, more likely to occur if you're taking the same batch that has caused um, the weakness or the paralysis previously as well. In terms of um, first aid, there isn't an awful lot of specific stuff to mention. Just be, uh, you know, stay warm, uh, rest. If you are affected by the weakness, rest the muscles and be mindful that it may well come on suddenly again, even after it's seemingly gone away. Um, so it's really common for people to get weakness of the legs that stops them from being able to walk 
and then they go to stand up again 20 minutes later, half an hour later, when they feel like the strength has come back, only to find that as soon as they try and walk again, the weakness comes back and they fall over. So um, just be mindful that it has that pattern as well. Um, be mindful of the possible side effects of the old antihistamines if you are intending to try and use those to manage with lover's paralysis. I, um, I'm not sure that there's a good reason to recommend that widely, but I'm also not here to give any specific medical advice, but I think it's worth, um, you know, looking into that and giving it some consideration about whether it's worth the possible side effects of some of those older sedating antihistamines um, for, you know, what some have anecdotally touted might help um, help with paralysis. And call for help if you get concerned. I think it is important that if you or someone you're with is really badly affected by this, that they... Um, have their breathing monitored. If this can affect all of the other skeletal muscles, there is the at least theoretical possibility that it may affect the muscles of respiration and impair your breathing at some point or in some situation in combination with other drugs that can do that or a health problem um, or, you know, who really knows what else at this stage. We're just not sure. Um, and a lot of people in our survey did report some subjective difficulty with breathing during this experience. So it is important that if somebody is uh, having really bad wood loves paralysis, you monitor that they are breathing appropriately. Look out for any signs of sedation, lethargy, blueness in the face, pallor, um, you know, getting getting pale, getting breathless. And I think it's always better to call for help early um, if you have major concerns and, um, you know, apply your basic first aid as well. So making sure that if somebody is having difficulty breathing, they're in the recovery position and being monitored as well. Um, so that's my little talk about uh, psychedelic mushroom harm reduction and I hope that's really helpful if anyone has any questions um, please feel free to reach out 